The intent of this video is to capture the basic chronology of events during the first 36 hours of the Howe Ridge Fire, ignited by lightning in Glacier National Park on the evening of August 11, 2018. By that time, the National Fire Community had been at planning level 5, the highest, for two weeks. Firefighting resources, including aircraft, crews, teams, and overhead, were largely committed to fires burning across much of the western United States. The Northern Rockies geographic area was at a high planning level three and moved to PL4 the next day. Local fire danger was very high and the last rain had been five weeks earlier. So while snowpack over the winter was at or above normal, fuel moistures were approaching historic lows and flash drought conditions were prevalent across the zone. Severity funding had been approved for Glacier National Park allowing for extended staffing and boosting with outside resources, including an engine and additional personnel. August 11th was a red flag day when a weather system moved through from the northwest, bringing little moisture but widespread lightning. Fires ignited across northwest Montana and the new starts further taxed the limited resources, leading interagency fire managers to prioritize by considering values at risk. Of 19 confirmed new starts across the zone, the majority were caught at initial attack with effective interagency coordination. Fire managers knew, based on fuel type and location, that the remaining fires on the Flathead National Forest and Glacier National Park had the potential to be long-term suppression events. Just give a quick rundown of the lightning uh, bus we had on uh, August 11th. Lost Creek Fire, which was a uh, main priority for the forest at the time. Uh, we had the Reed, divide, Reed and Divide fires up in this area. And then we had Tally Mountain Fire, Paola Ridge, and uh, Cole Ridge, and Will Butte up in the North Fork. The main issue was to get the, the fires west of town dealt with. On Saturday, um, August 11th, about oh, 7.15, the ranger from Sprague Creek Campground spotted a smoke um, on Howl Ridge here. So I made the initial call here probably, oh, 8 o'clock um, to, to Kalispell Dispatch that I was going to be EIC, named it the Howl Ridge Fire. Um, I call it half to a uh, tenth to a half acre, um, no structures threatened, and we're working our way to try to see, you know, if we can get access to the, to the fire and just get a better look at its, at its behavior. Um, I kind of got uh, out ahead of my two crew members and walked out this ridge to uh, almost to this 4190 point here looking across. This distance was probably a half mile. It took me almost an hour to get out here just because of the dead and down and the climbing. We were not gonna be able to make it to the fire because of terrain, the snag hazards, the time of day, you know, it's getting dark, and that we were going to egress back out the Trout Lake Trail down to our truck and made the resource order for the following ship for more personnel and, and aircraft. So we got back, I gathered up with my crew, got back down to the, to the engine about 10 o'clock and then we drove back and then came in at 0700 here at West Glacier. I knew I wouldn't be able to sleep if I didn't go look at it one more time. So I went up there about midnight, one o'clock and just watched it, Look, looked at it with binoculars and saw what it was doing and then so early in the morning after I looked at the fire came in and just started jotting things down on the whiteboard for for the possibility that we're not going to catch the fire in initial attack. Four generations of our family have survived the summers in Kelly's camp where we had the Moose Fire, the Roberts Fire, and the Sprague Fire. But we and Glacier National Park didn't learn enough from these fires 
in order to survive the Howe Ridge fire. And those 14 firefighters that hiked up that trail, their initial thoughts up there were uh, to find a, a place to spike. That was in the discussion in the morning, finding a place to spike up on the ridge so that they could work. And I believe they had all their stuff kind of ready to go down here if they found a spot. With my position, I'm also the aviation officer for the Northwestern Land Office. So my involvement started early that morning with getting the CL-215s up. And we got the CL-215s mobilized up to the fire that morning. So this is very similar to the fuel loading near the origin and all along Hal Ridge, um, what the fire is currently burning in. And we're always thinking about escape routes and safety zones. So to get back out through this stuff takes some time. And so the more you get kind of committed into an area, we're always reevaluating how long does it take to get back out but we were coming up above the fire, which at that time of day, around two o'clock, 1400, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a good place to be. The way the fire, the fire was picking up, direct attack was, in my head, not, not an option. The part by the 12th had the Heaven Sank fire, the Numa Ridge fire, and then also on the Flathead National Forest, they had multiple ongoing fires, multiple fires that were exceeding that type 4 capability and uh, all our resources and the forest resources were basically tapped out with all these other fires in the area. Early afternoon we called again and we were talking about the effectiveness of the CL-215s because we had another higher priority fire. If, this, if they weren't being effective here we would move them to another incident. Um, and we had Dave on the phone talking about that. He said, you know, looking at the fire behavior, um, they're not gonna, they're not gonna do a, a tremendous amount more this afternoon if we bring them up. The old thought of fires um, taking care of future fires is not necessarily the case with with this fuel type, with the large, heavy, dead and down component that that was left after the 2003 fires. Knowing that this is a difficult fuel type, but in no case did we think that it was going to be a, a fuel type that could run a thousand acres in a couple hours. Um, knowing that this was in the Roberts fire burn scar, and having experience from from a, a fire in that type of in the, actually the same burn scar outside of the park, the Glacier Rim fire, probably one of the hotter fires I've ever worked on. I knew that uh, the heat was going to be extreme. You know, most of that fuel is drier than a than a standard kiln dry two by four that you buy. So if you imagine stacking a, a eight six to eight foot tall pile all going different directions, the two by fours and lighting it, and then how close can you get to it? Definitely fire behavior that I didn't anticipate. Um, it was very extreme. Um, you know, it's, it was not what you would expect in that fuel type. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a full fuel, fuel dominated uh, fire that was being pushed downhill by wind. Mm -hmm. And, you know, go back to the typical saying is, this fire would typically spot downhill and then come back up and grow together. 
Um, this just moved moved right across the hill downhill as fast as you'd watch any crown fire move uphill. So um, that was interesting fire behavior for me watching that. Um, there are a lot of folks that say, well, fire historically doesn't travel south in this area, but you know, every year it seems like fires seem to rewrite history on us. So it's, it's hard to just say, well, historically it's not gonna do this. Um, and that's anywhere we go anymore, so. Right. Um, in terms of the, the tipping over and the fire branding and quick growth, not just a spot that slowly grows. Right. Um, that was a, a fire behavior like most fire behaviors we've had the last couple of years up here, is something that someone says, well, I haven't seen that before. You know, this was, this was something that was off the charts. And I think every season in the last six or eight I can think of, someplace in the country is like this is this is unprecedented. We called out and the uh, the lookout on the fire which I think was across the lake probably at Sprague or someplace like that we asked them what are the odds of the fire coming down to the road tonight burning down to the road tonight and his his reply was the fire hasn't burned downhill all day and we thought okay so we got a little bit of time here I was kind of monitoring the radio in the background and people were working through uh, different things and trying to get resources and, and, and things in, in order for the next operational period. And there was, a, there was a radio call that caught my ear and it, and it said, we have a spot fire above the ranger station. And I, I sat up and I looked around to see if anybody else heard that because I wasn't sure that I heard that right because we had, we had heard that it wasn't burning down to the road. Um, and so, I looked around and no one else had really perked up to that and so I went over and talked to Jeremy and a few other folks and I said, did you just hear that on the radio? And they said, no. And they said, well, they said there's a spot fire above the ranger station at the head of the lake. And that immediately uh, caused a lot of concern and uh, three of us at least that, I can, that I'm aware of uh, got into our vehicles, got our stuff and went up the lake to see what was going on, you know, get a first hand view of what was going on. So about the time I start driving up, I get to where we have, um, I think the fire has had some, some lookouts there at what we call Jackson Bay, which is pull out right across from the lake, right before you get to Lake McDonald Lodge. And I look at the fire, I'm like, holy crap, <laughs> that thing's pretty big, and it seems to me that it's wrapping around Mount Stanton, coming downhill a little, little bit, coming downhill, and, and like looked to me like I was ready to rip up the drainage. I attempted with the help of my nephew to attach sprinkler heads to cabin five and cabin six and start the fire pump. At that time, my brother-in-law, who was observing from Lake McDonald Lodge, called and instructed his family to leave camp immediately as the fire had blown up and was rapidly moving towards us. My niece, Karen, asked my nephew, Mike, to get the boat, collect the kids, and leave. They didn't have enough car transportation to get the kids out. I can hear some of the radio traffic from the firefighters at the Wheeler place and the ranger station and they're talking about embers coming down um, and then they talked about hot embers coming down and that was before I could see the fire. Um, Lima 14 and Lima 10 I believe were up there. So I contacted them as I was driving, had them meet me at the Lake McDonald ranger station and immediately upon arriving I briefed the first heli that was there. Go down to Kelly Camp and immediately vac evacuate all those people. There wasn't any formal pre-evacuation notices or anything like that. But it was, it was evident to me what needed to occur there. 
So we got that going quickly and then waited, you know, with with a lot of anxiety waiting for those LE rigs to come back out and tell me that they had evacuated everybody down there. A few minutes later, two GNP Rangers entered Kelly's camp and instruct, instructed everyone, if they chose to do so, that they should be leave immediately. Within five minutes, I moved two propane tanks to the beach, collected our dogs, and was hit on the arm by one burning ember. I got in the truck and followed my wife out of camp. As I drove past Dry Creek, I noticed that the fire had spotted across the road. Flames were close to the road on the uphill side, and the heat radiated through the truck's glass. Just past Trout Lake Trailhead, both sides of the road were totally engulfed in flames. My wife slowed for a second, hit the gas, and I followed her through the flames. I was off duty. Uh, my wife and I enjoy spending time at the Lake McDonald Ranger Station, so we drove up there that afternoon. Uh, around seven o'clock, uh, we could see or we could feel the wind shift direction more towards the east, and we started seeing spot fires coming down the hillside uh, towards the ranger station. Uh, from my perspective, it looked like maybe the spot fires were three quarters of the way down the hill. I knew that the fire crew was still in the area and one of the other rangers I work with was in the area as well. So I went over to go talk to them, uh, notify them about the spot fire and also ask about Kelly Camp. Um, at that time, they were on the radio discussing uh, the spot fires and ma had made the decision to evacuate Kelly Camp. Making the decision to go with them to help evacuate, I knew that they were short on numbers with rangers. Just in my experience working in public safety, uh, there, was, there was no question in my mind that that's what needed to be done. With how, the, how quickly the fire came down the hillside, it was clear that the road was going to be cut off and we had very little time to evacuate Kelly Camp. Evacuating Kelly Camp took about a little over 10 minutes, I think. Uh, most of the residents there were already prepared to evacuate. Uh, on the way out, the spot fires had moved to both sides of the road uh, and maybe 100 yards outside of Kelly Camp, we encountered fire on both sides of the road, uh, touching the vehicles. That call at seven o'clock surprised me. You know, the conditions had changed so severely, so quickly. Like, oh my gosh. It was an emergency evacuation. Well, we, when we got to Kelly Camp, we swept the entire, the entire camp for uh, people. Um, there was a, a vehicle that belonged to some people that were camping out on the north, on the Lake McDonald uh, backcountry site, but they were nowhere to be seen. With the Sprague fire, we had a lot of time right. to do evacuations and get people out. With this fire, we didn't really have a lot of time at all. If we had waited maybe about 10 minutes, it's a possibility we wouldn't have been able to get out. Dad, this is insane. I know. We don't want to get trapped in here. Easy, easy. All right, we're good. Easy out. Easy. Dad, the car is heating up. It's going to explode. Right. Oh, Jesus, God, help us. All right, right. Slow it down. Okay, slow it down so we can see. All these things are happening um, all at once. So. Uh, transfer of command, ordered up any and every aircraft that we could get, place an order for uh, the county if they could provide us some structure protection. One Five Fox arrived from another incident with Bucket. When he got on scene, I asked him to patrol behind us over where the column was leaning over and tell me if there's any spot fires or any fire behavior starting up um, to the north of us. Um, and he couldn't get in there to see, see much. That smoke column was laying right over the top of the trees. So then I asked him if he could 
fly down to Kelly Camp and give me an assessment of where that fire was in relation to the homes in that area. He said there wasn't anything he could do, but it was still an, an eighth of a mile away from the structures. This fire is really wind driven right now. Pretty amazing. This is taken from the wheeler. I spoke with Brothwell and Bernie. I want you two to be the ones to make the decision when you're gonna pull these resources out to safety and let the fire do its thing. Five minutes later, uh, Bernie and Brothwell made the decision to move their folks out. 8.38 on the 12th of August, big firestorm just approaching the Wheeler States, Wheeler Cabin. Firefighters have been pulled out. Embers blowing over our heads. Landing, yeah, cutting off our escape route, so we're getting out of here. Big, big wind still blowing. One of the cabins was well involved with fire on the front, and I knew that there was there was nothing that could be done for that particular structure and that it was probably going to also burn the adjacent structures to it. Um, but the size of the yard there and the defensible space that was around there and the fire behavior that we had, it was quite safe to be there to just uh, observe what was happening. Initially that we didn't know what the fire behavior was going to do as it came through there. so we. We made people safe. Yeah. No prayer there, man. Oh, oh. And then as things sort of calmed down and um, I started looking around, felt it was safe to bring some folks back in as the one wheeler cabin was still uh, in good shape and, and there wasn't any fire involvement with that one, although all the rest of the the structures were fully involved or collapsed at that point already. So I brought in uh, the nearest Type 6 engine. The wind was still blowing a lot of embers around, so I said, I think it's safe to be here. If you guys are comfortable being here, I want you to protect this structure. So they, they accepted the mission and they got their hose out and started um, putting out some of these spots around the cabin and that's when I heard one of them yell that there was smoke coming out of the eave of the cabin. They asked me if I knew how to, if I had a key to unlock the, the cabin. So I said, no, just break in. They opened the shutter. There's a glass window right there. They just popped it with a Pulaski. We were able to open the door. They went upstairs. There was a fire extinguisher hanging right there and they sprayed it out the, out the peak of that roof. And then we also drugged the hard line from the engine to the front door and were able to spray up to the top of the ceiling with, uh, with just the one inch hard line there. So I'm looking around and I see that the ranger station roof has fire on it too. So at that point I called, called for some more help. I uh, just took the, took the sprinkler out of the yard and threw it up on the roof of the, of the ranger station, which easily extinguish that fire. We didn't plan for the fire to be blowing up Lake McDonald drainage the way it was. So that was that was not part of the plan, but as far as the response from the time I left this office till the time I got back to this office was a huge success with the resources that we had and the unplanned events that we had to deal with. You know, the lodge probably had several hundred people, you know, just employees, people, people with rooms. Um, landowners, you know, there's, I'd say, 50 to 100 actual individuals, not nearly as many vehicles. Um, Avalanche Campground has 100 odd campsites. Mm -hmm. Sprague Campground, much smaller, a couple dozen sites. That's, mm -hmm. that's pretty easy. There's, Quite a few backcountry campgrounds that are served by the, the going to the Sun Road. So it's probably to the tune of a thousand, thousand plus people that were displaced that evening.
we put out fires here. All we had were a five gallon bucket and then maybe a gallon and a half bucket. And Heather and I worked on this for, we were trying to figure out, but 30 to 45 minutes um, that morning. Real danger with the trees. You see the one right behind you that's uh, the cedar tree that's burned out a lot at the base. We obviously can't do much with that, but we did throw buckets on it to try and slow some of these down a little bit. Uh, you can see this is part of an old foundation of the place that was burning uh, right next to it. You see where it's all charred. You can see the discolorization where it was burning right next to it. And then you can see how hot it was melting the paint on the side of the place up here. I don't know how this did not catch on fire at some point in the evening. But the devastation's unbelievable. It's hard to, pictures can't quite capture probably what you see in person, but. August 13th morning after a firestorm last night. This is what's left of the Park Service Boathouse. Coming up on Wheeler Residence here. Main cabin. Still standing. Everything else is pretty much gone, I think. The Howe Ridge Fire had a local, organized, interagency Type 3 incident management team in place Monday morning, August 13th. They managed the fire until a Type 1 incident management team arrived and took command of the Howe Ridge Fire, along with three other fires on the neighboring Flathead National Forest, on August 16th. Over the next month, the fire continued slow, steady growth. The team used structure protection with other suppression actions to keep the fire from making significant runs that would impact resources and infrastructure. Heavy equipment and burnout operations were completed to reinforce existing containment lines. Fire has always been a part of Glacier National Park and will continue to shape its ever-changing landscape, as well as the people who manage, reside, and visit here. Fire managers are already using lessons learned from the Howe Ridge Fire to better prepare for future fires taking into consideration how they affect existing relationships, as well as the cultural and natural history of the area.